we're still in self-quarantine here, although it looks like Kyle and I are sitting next to each other. We're actually several hundred, maybe a thousand miles apart. I don't know how far it is to Seattle from Bakersfield, but um, this is my special guest over here, Kyle Kuniki, and we'll get to him in just a minute. First, let's see who's on here. My name's Suzanne Bryan, and this is Suzanne Off the Cuff, a live interview. If you're watching this after the fact, you can still read everyone's comments, and you can comment too. So we have Evelyn. Hello, Evelyn. Sherry Cornick from Canton, Michigan. Dolise is from uh, Washington State. Aline Mazuka from Monterey. Judith Louch from Indiana. Duke of Nico from Memphis. Charles Gandy from Georgia. Michaud Dion from Montreal. Francoise from Lyon, France. Fatima Dehan is from Portugal. Scott Tignor is from uh, the Bay Area. And he says, hi, Kyle. And um, Judy from Davenport. That guy from Kevin in Memphis. Susan Day from Washington. Susan McBride from Scottsdale. Champ Smith from New York City. Sylvia Earle from Cameron Park. Margit Hirsch from uh, Germany. And Kurt Payne from New Zealand. Nancy Drummond from Ontario. So hello, everyone. Now remember, um, it's okay to ask Kyle questions, and if you would like to ask a question, please put the word QUESTION in all caps right at the beginning of your comment. And we've got Kelly Mycat from New Hampshire, Eldonna Rhodes from Oklahoma, Pat from Tacoma, uh, Ruth from Missouri, Sally Yanita from Indonesia. So welcome everyone. If you haven't met Kyle before, he is, he loves color work, and he loves uh, doing stranded type knitting. Kyle and I first met at Madrona in Tacoma, Washington, several years ago. I don't, it's been quite a while. And he was, at that time, working on level one of the Master Hand Knitting Program, which he will address in a bit in our conversation. <sighs> And we didn't really hit it off at first either, you know, um, because I was it, I was a um, co-chair in the Master Hand Knitting Program, and our guidelines for doing stranded knitting are very, very strict. It is to a certain degree that you have to do it. And he had surpassed that. He had moved beyond that and was doing his own interpretations of stranded knitting, which are absolutely stunningly beautiful, and that's why I wanted him to be on here. So at that time, we were a little bit at odds with each other because I was doing stranded knitting in the traditional way, and Kyle was doing stranded knitting in the Kyle way, which he, he will tell you about in a few minutes. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Kyle. Kyle, why did you start knitting in the first place? What brought you to knitting? Why? why? Um, hello, Suzanne. Hello, everyone. <laughs> um, I actually, the very first time I started knitting was back in 2003, and I was living in Hollywood, which is actually Los Angeles, California. Um, Hollywood sounds fancier, I think, but it's not really a city. Um, so I was living in Hollywood with um, my former high school theater director, Deborah, and she was knitting. So this was 2003. It was the world of... Um, fun fur and eyelash yarn and novelty yarn and she um is one of my favorite artists that i've ever met that i get to work with and uh she works a lot with color and of course texture so she wasn't uh the best knitter in the universe of course she, she um knew how to pearl and very basic stitches but her forte was combining um, texture, different colors and, and patterns and things. So she would work a few rows of one kind of yarn and then another, and she had, you know, accumulated collections of yarns and different palettes. And through that, she made these really great works that were awesome. And um, I was homesick one day, and she was knitting, and we were watching bad TV, and she was knitting, and I said, why do you do that? Like, it looks boring, it looks tedious, it looks stressful, um, you know, because I'm watching it and getting stressed out because I don't understand how to do it. And she said, you know, you should really give it a shot. Like, just give it a try. Um, 
you know, knitting, once you know the basics, becomes meditative and it's, you know, allows you to relax and it's not stressful and all of that. I said, well, you know, okay, fine. So I finished my bowl of cereal that I was eating um, and she cast on for me, handed me a giant skein of yarn and showed me the knit stitch. And I, the very first thing I ever made was lace. The, the cool thing about that, everyone thinks that lace is really hard. And really, I think it's one of the easiest things to do. Um, making intentional lace might be a little more challenging than uh, what I did because, you know, I started with 30 stitches. And when I finished my row, I had 47 stitches. And then the next row, I had 22 stitches because I, you know, wasn't working every stitch the way that it needed to be worked. <laughs> um, so by the end of the end of that giant skein of yarn, I was keeping a constant, you know, I narrowed it down to, you know, 20 stitches and I had 20 all the way through and okay, now I've got this. So I figured out, all right, so now I'm doing garter stitch, you know, just knitting every row, but now I want my own needles and I want my own yarn. And I wanted to go to a shop. So we went to a, our local yarn shop there in um, Los Angeles. And I chose some yarn and I chose needles, size 13, US 13 needles. That was the only size I'm ever going to knit with. I'm never going to knit with anything else. That <laughs> and um, I, you know, of course, ended up with other needles and things. But for three years, I only did garter stitch striped um, using collections of yarn, just copying, parroting what Deborah was doing. I made blankets and shawls and anything that could have been rectangle. That's what I did um, until I moved just north of Los Angeles and started going to a yarn shop and hanging out at a shop with, with people there. And there's this woman there named Terry who said, you know, Kyle, there are these things called patterns. I'm not sure if you've heard of them before. <laughs> But if you follow these instructions, they uh, lead you to have something other than a blanket or a scarf. And, you know, would you like to have a sweater? It's not hard to do the same things plus a little bit more and end up with other finished projects. So I listened to Terry and started making a sweater or two. And um, then I realized I wanted to make my own stuff because... I'm an artist, you know, I like to make things and create. And I also um, like to share pattern and color and, and story with people through different mediums. And so I started uh, making my own stuff there. So basically I learned to knit because I was sick one day and because I asked someone why. Of course, growing up, my mom crocheted. Um, my grandmother crocheted like, like, um, all the time she did a lot of sewing and repair work and making do and a lot of, uh, repair. She, um, uh, actually one of my favorite things that she did was she worked for Kentucky fried chicken when Kentucky fried chicken was Kentucky fried chicken instead of KFC. And she repaired their uniforms. They used to have these brown polyester suit, like, um, look like UPS uniforms that they wore as uh, their work clothes. And I guess they were fairly expensive, but her job was to do what she could to repair those. So she would get grease out and patch holes in jeans and all kinds of stuff. But yeah, so um, from her, I learned a little bit of patience and, you know, something goes wrong, you stop and say, okay, well, what do I do? Um, assess the situation, figure out what to do and move forward after you know, the panic of discovering something has gone awry is, you know, um, so yeah, that's how I rambled a bit. I told people I would ramble. That's okay. That's uh, okay. There you go. So at <laughs> what point did you decide that you wanted to, do, how did you hear about the Master Hand Knitting Program and how did you get involved with that and tell us how that went? Ah, so, well, um, I, I'm not sure, I'm sure just Google led me to the Master Hand Knitting Program, and uh, for people who don't know, it is a, correct me if I'm wrong, or if things have changed, um, it's a three-level um, opportunity for anyone at any level to um, 
provide themselves a framework to learn more about the craft. So for me, I said, okay, this is awesome. I like learning. I do like learning. Um, and I signed up immediately for the first level. And the first level requires a series of swatches that include um, knitting and purling. Um, it's all just knits and pearls in the first. And some increases, decreases. Like yeah. increase, decrease. Yeah, you Super do, basic. There's one cable swatch. Yeah. But all one color yeah. work, I believe. Like not right. color work. Um, and um, so I did that, but there's there are requirements with all of these. So, for example, um, there are a number of swatches that must all be um, produced using the same size needle. And the key in case anyone wants to know, I believe is the seed stitch swatch. So you, you figure out your seed stitch swatch gauge, and from there you're able to the other parts of that problem. Um, and just making seed stitch is wonderful, and if you make a seed stitch that you're happy with, that's fine. But the challenge or the opportunity to learn is to make seed stitch that meets a certain standard. And um, beyond that, you must cast on and you must bind off. And so for the seed stitch swatch, you manufacture this little piece of fabric and attach to it a little label, you know, kind of, you know, a label like this kind of thing that says like what the swatch number is and the cast on. And then you must cite, just like in school, where did you learn that cast on? Where did it come from? And that that would be supported by a bibliography that you also produce and deliver in in your packet. Where or how did you learn this seed stitch? And so on and so forth. Um, there are questions. You must write a, a paper on blocking. It was on blocking way back when. It's, I believe it's still on blocking, which is good. Um, it's really important to block things. I, um, I cringe when people say, I'm done with this project. I just have to weave in the ends and, and block it. Well, you're not done. You're not done quite yet. You're almost done. Um, you're done with the knitting part. Um, but uh, so you have to do all of these things. And so you submit this large uh, collection of work that takes a good amount of time uh, and effort, certainly. And also uh, the ability to question What's the best increase to use when you're doing a knit two, purl two, and you need to increase three times across the row, and you're going to go into stock and net stitching, so knitting a row, purling a row. What's the best, what's the most reasonable increase, and how do you do that? Okay, well, this is the answer, and you know, the answer can, you can find the answer, and then you have to be able to say, well, how do you know that? Where did that come from? So there's a lot of um, soul searching involved and it does take time so this this entire packet is delivered to uh i think two different people review the packet um and inevitably some pieces will be sent back or questions will be returned to you with uh the ask that you further elaborate or remake a swatch so that you can learn more um and then you do that and then Maybe those all go through, and if they do, then you move to level two. And level two involves color work, I believe. Um, there's a large project in each one. And then level three, if it's still the same level three as cable stuff, and the final project was designing an Aaron sweater, so a cable-y, beautiful, amazing sweater. Um, and then once you've passed all three levels, you earn the title master knitter, master hand knitter, um, from the program, and you may go about your day uh, study that's formal. Um, I'm still at level one, and I think that that is super okay. Um, I believe that no matter where you go through that process, it's not uh, it's not necessary to complete it in one year. It's it's not necessary to even do level one, two, and three. You can start level one, complete it, work to level two, and finish. Um, the thing that I took out of it, the, the most important thing, I think, is the ability to look more critically at the work that I do. Um, I am human, 
And uh, I think we, almost everyone who knits is human. We don't know for sure, who knows, but uh, we're all, you know, we're all human. We all have the ability to learn from people who have made uh, the same types of crafts as we are uh, doing now. And uh, we all have the opportunity to grow. So one of the things that I do know is that, um, and I learned from this uh, process of working some of my swatches, um, is that everyone swatches. People will say online or in groups, you know, knitting groups or whatever, I never swatch. I just cast on with this size and I always get gauge. Well, gauge is a result of swatching first of all, right? So you knit a thing and you measure it and that is what your gauge is. The only way anyone could ever get gauge is to swatch something. So everyone swatches. Everyone who's watching is swatching and I'm one, everyone who's watching is swatching. That's funny. Um, the choice is how large of a swatch do you want to make? So um, in designing we make a swatch that's six inches square, eight inches square, um, or larger sometimes to sort out problems, to figure out tension, to make sure we're happy with the motif that we're doing, to uh, decide what the best increase or decrease um, is. And sometimes it's not always the same one every time we encounter that um step sometimes you you know maybe you need to knit two together and then sometimes you need to do a center double decrease somewhere else and then somewhere else you do some other thing um and then we have to stop and study that and from there we learn lessons so whether it's this little tiny you know piece of fabric that we do or a completely finished garment we learn all kinds of things well i could have use knit front and back at the end of every second knit stitch in a knit to purl to, to increase for this ribbing uh, so that I had the right number. I could have, you know, done a different kind of, you know, under the arm a treatment. I could have done a different seaming treatment. And so instead of having to go back and remake an entire garment, you have the opportunity to move forward with those things. Um, it's the same with every piece that we make, whether it is making a simple two color, you know, work two rows of one color of yarn and two rows of another color of yarn for a scarf. Um, joining the yarns in the middle of a row is not an ideal situation. We learn that by doing it and then either the piece falling apart or discovering that there are knots uh, or, you know, tying a knot and weaving in the ends. And then there's these bulky little spots all through the middle of our work. Well, if it's not ideal, we learn that as a lesson and we move forward in our work and we say, okay, well maybe next time I've knit seven stitches into my scarf and realize it's time to um, change yarns. I've out of yarn back those stitches up, join the new yarn and ca and carry on. Or, you know, depending on the yarn content, maybe you're going to do a spit splice or a Russian join or some other technique that you have learned. So um, swatching is the most important thing. I believe that swatching is almost synonymous with the word knitting because both of these things teach us lessons. And um, we learn from them and they inform our future work, whether it's, you know, making something for ourselves, doing things for charity or, um, you know, working professionally and designing for publications. So, Excellent. So there have been a couple questions here. Uh, one I'll ask later on. It'll be a oh, bit later. But this is from Fatima Ham, and she has completed level one of the Master Hand Knitting Program. She's getting ready to go into level two. Good job. And she says, what part of the program of level two did you enjoy less? But make you didn't start level two yet, right? <laughs> the thing I really enjoyed less was not finishing level one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I would say, um, uh, the I don't know that there's much difference in any of the levels. I believe that the entire program is really designed well. I believe that if you enter into it realizing 
that you have the opportunity to, to, to learn using this program that has been developed by people who have studied this for so many years. Um, and you have the mindset to be able to do it. I apparently, right now, I don't have that mindset, and that's okay. Um, you will be successful. Knitting is not hard. It takes time, and you have to want to do it. It's very basic. Like The steps that we follow are very simple. And I believe you can do it, especially, gosh, you've done level one. That's fantastic. Um, I say dive into it take your time and enjoy the process. Um, and remember that it's an opportunity to learn things. Um, and as you learn, the people around you in your community are also going to benefit from your knowledge because you're going to say, wait, wait a minute. This is, do you know, there's an, there's another way that you can do this that will make your project look even better than it does right now. And you'll be able to spread that knowledge to other people. And I think that's really the ultimate goal. I mean, the label is a really awesome label to be, you know, a fancy master hand knitter, but to have the ability to help other people in your community become more proficient in, in their craft, that I think is the ultimate goal. So yeah, good for you. Yes, awesome. made for Fatima. So yeah. um, the reason I wanted Kyle to talk about that was because Many people start level one and don't finish all the way to level three. And that does not mean you're a failure. Obviously, he is not a failure. He's very successful, you know. So um, if you go and you get into it, you will learn something. No matter how far you go into it or how deep or how shallow, you will get something out of it. And it will benefit you for the rest of your life in your knitting. So it's not like you're if you're going to do level one that you're committing at that point to go all the way through to become a master hand knitting, you're not. You're just saying, I'm going to work on level one. And then right. if you complete level one, you can think whether you want to do level two, so on and so on. So there's no crime in not finishing it. There's something for everybody at every point in the master hand knitting program. But this isn't about that. I just wanted him to talk <laughs> about that because I knew that he had been in it. Um, yeah. So... But Kyle ended up being more interested in color work. So let's have you talk a little bit about that and maybe show some of your projects. Sure. I have, um, so I have a pile of, I'm glad the camera is only this big. Um, I have a lot of stuff around me. So Suzanne and I, when we first met, one of the questions I had for her, she was at the table for the master's program. And one of the questions I had to her was regarding color work and stranded color work in particular, because the kind of um, work I like to do does not have floats along the back, which are traditional stranded knitting. Um, and Suzanne very graciously corrected me and said, yes, that is beautiful. And it is not what we are looking for. And I, it took a little while to understand that, what she meant was we are looking for the reason for the basic process that so that people are confident in why we do a certain thing a certain way. So I, I do have a sample here. Um, let's see this way. So, um, so this, and I'll just sort of hold it here in front of my face. Um, this is a sample that shows traditional stranded knitting although this obviously is not a traditional stranded pattern, mostly because of these really long sections here um, of single color work. Usually we change colors every inch or so of knitting. Um, and if the piece falls outside of traditional, the floating yarn needs to be trapped or locked within that longer than one inch space. So on this one from, sorry, I, I didn't realize this would be as difficult as it is. We'll do it this way. I'll fold it in half. Um, so from right here up, you'll notice that these tiny, tiny little, I'm going to try to, can you see that? The little yellow dots to the right and left of this horizontal line or above and below the horizontal line, the little yellow dots that are above that line are smaller than this, the dots below it. Can you see that, Suzanne? Is that kind of sort of clear? It, I can see it. Good. So 
What happened at that point is we changed the order of the yarns in this. So, um, which is a whole nother, probably a whole nother discussion about yarn color or yarn dominance, like which yarn makes a bigger stitch. So the yarn that's held when you're doing stranded knitting and you're holding your yarn in both hands, the yarn in the left hand um, travels the lower path. So it's another L, left, lower. It also um, yields a larger stitch. So from here up, these are all the blue yarn was in the left hand. So all of these blue stitches are just a tiny, tiny bit larger than all of the yellow stitches. And from here down, the order was changed and we put the yellow yarn in the left hand. And that means that the yellow yarn made a larger stitch. So the reason I'm bringing this up right now is one, because that's what I talk about with this um, swatch, but also when you are working on a project and you're doing stranded colored work, make a note. I like to work with printed patterns and I like to um, write on them as I'm working. Um, make a note and say yellow and draw an arrow to the left and blue and draw an arrow to the right or whatever works for you so that you remember after you set this down and you pick it back up and you start to work again so that those yarns don't uh, order doesn't change that way. I mean, this is, I mean, unfortunately we did this in such a perfect spot. It's really hard to see, but if this was a larger re repeating um, pattern and we had stopped in the middle of uh, the, the pattern and changed the order of the yarn, then you would really be able to see that. And it may not note, may not read as something that is, a mistake it just will look like there's something not quite right about that sleeve something's different it looks darker or it looks lighter um, and that's the why so if I turn this around you'll see you know there are these long floats on uh, on the work so the work that I do is um, locked floats or Armenian knitting where the yarns are, they're not wrapped around each other. That is twined knitting. Um, these, um, the yarns stay, the right yarn stays in my right hand, the left yarn stays in my left hand. They never switch. And it's by like wrapping and unwrapping them during the production of each stitch that they are secured within themselves. So, um, I want to see if I have something that will. This so, is a, so you're talking. You're talking. What you're saying is you trap them after each stitch. You're not wrapping them. Wrapping them is the twine yes. knitting, but trapping is the the more of the Armenian knitting. Yes. Okay. So uh, this is this is locking floats. For that's example, the, that's the wrong side of the work. It is. Um, this is the the front of that same piece, the cowl, um, but you can go and go and go with one color of yarn and um, keep the same density of fabric. So yeah, so this cowl is a, um, is that. And one of the first things that um, I do actually is after finishing the ribbing section, the first round of pattern where you just People will have you knit one round of the same color as the ribbing so that you get rid of the opportunity for pearl bumps to sneak through. I will do that, but at the same time, I will carry that the secondary color behind your color all the way around just to add some thickness to oh, yeah. the work so that this doesn't go boop, you know, and it helps, helps a lot. Blocking now, also helps. How, how does it affect the uh, <laughs> lateral stretching of the fabric? Um, I believe that it actually improves it. And the reason that I believe it improves it is that the biggest challenge that people have in traditional stranded knitting is um, being able to manage their floats. So they're not floats too tight. Too long. They're not long enough. In this case, the floats aren't long at all because there are no floats. 
the yarn is managed very much like the the yarn that's being knitted. And while it's a little bit smaller because it doesn't, you know, go forward and make a stitch and come back, it is enough of uh, the material that the finished garment, uh, it, it doesn't make it um, sloppy at all. Sloppy is a bad word, but um, unless you wanted it to be sloppy. So, um, yeah, so that is So that. I'm thinking, now I haven't done my floats like that, but I'm just thinking about, so when you do trap floats, as you say, they tend to go up and over a little bit. They're not going straight through. You know, when you trap it, it does cause a little deviation of its path, right? A little bit, yes. A little but, bit. Uh, Whereas yes, if, you didn't, so, if you didn't trap it, you'd have this straight strand following behind. The stranding part would be straight. And if it were trapped, then where you trap it, it gets a little hump there. So yes, if you're trapping you have, it after, but, if you trap it after every stitch, you're going to have a little bit more yarn in that strand than if it weren't trapped. So that seems like it would give it a little bit more stretchability to me. Just yeah, thinking about they, it. Yeah, it ends up being um, the stitches. The only thing I've really noticed is that the actual gauge ends up being square. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Which is very interesting. Um, they're pretty so much square uh, and stranded knitting, too. You know, they're more square than they are rectangular. Yeah. So every time I've measured my gauge, it's been square, which is yeah. kind of That's very cool. cool. Well, it makes it much easier for making designs, you know. Yeah. And you don't. So, you can use regular graph paper instead of knitter's graph paper. Yes. Yes. Um, so this is that same. I'll see if you guys can see. Um this is that same little motif uh, that the stranded thing is, but this was done with locked floats. Of course, I've got it in a frame. This is on in triple aught needles, so this was done very small. Um, it's beautiful. And flat, and I love this little thing. Mm -hmm, it's beautiful. Uh, and I thought, oh, well, maybe that's what I want to make. Actually, I still want to make a cardigan following that but that pattern ended up being this one which um pardon me while i so this is a blanket essentially like a little lap throw that's Hard gorgeous beautiful beautiful oh. beautiful but uh that is what this ended up being and this happens to be all with um lock floats gorgeous so. Now, I kind of like that for the effect of a blanket because, you know, sometimes when people are doing larger projects like that, that they can, they're going to turn into a lap blanket or some, or a big, huge shawl, the inside of the fabric does have all those floats and not, not trapped every time, but the regular floats. And they can yes. be attractive, but they also can get caught very easily. You know, so on your project, on your blanket... And I've seen many, many people make stranded blankets and then they'll line the back to protect mm -hmm. it and put a border around it. But because you're catching the floats every single time, it protects them also and it gives you that nice double fabric. Really nice. Yeah. Beautiful. They, in quilting, they call larger stitches toe pickers. Uh huh. Because your toenail can get caught yes. in that stitch. I don't know that it's the most eloquent of descriptions, but yeah, it's kind of like a toe picker. Um, another one that people, so I'm going to disappear, but this is the uh, Demore wrap. So this project is knit, it's 400 and something stitches across, and it's worked side to side. The chart is broken up into seven sections, and uh, it's worked, you know, chart one, you go across that chart, and then chart two, and then three, four, and so on. And then once you're done, you flip back and forth that way. And the reason I did it that way, despite the chagrin of so many of my uh, friends, is because um, they said, well, why didn't you just work that in the round and you could steak it, just cut right in the middle and be done with it and put an edge. Well, I wanted this border to be exactly the same uh, thickness all the way around. Right, right. Now I've thought of a workaround, which would be to just work extra stitches at the top and extra at the bottom so that there's more material inside on all of it and it would be fine. But I really wanted it to be identical all the way through. And this is all locked floats as well. That's gorgeous. That's 
um, yeah, the Demore wrap. It's really awesome. This is in my book, so very cool. Now, it's not curling at the top or the bottom. Well, it a little bit it is. Um, this has not been steamed in. Does it have years. any pearl stitches in it on the front of the work nope. to keep it from curling? Nope. Wow. No. Nope. So yeah, someone, no. um, Champ Smith has asked, and I believe that that they're re talking about the orange blanket. What is the yarn on that beautiful blanket? Uh, very good question. Um, <laughs> it, is, it is escaping me right now. Um, it's almost as exciting as the name. I will tell you in just a second. Um, because I don't remember. It'll come to you when you're thinking about something else. Yeah. So the pattern itself is called um, Tin Ceiling. Oh, yeah. It's Anzula. Oh, yeah. Anzula. And the yarn is Cricket. So it's uh, Superwash Merino, Cashmere, and Nylon. Oh, yes. I so, love Anzula's yarns. Yeah, great yarn. Now, when you said you went to a, a knit shop north of Los Angeles, where was that? <laughs> Chatsworth. Chatsworth, yes. okay. So Chatsworth, yeah, the shop is no longer there. It was Bishop's in Chatsworth, and Florence Bishop was, um, for lack of better description, and because I know she can't hear us, most likely, she was just a cranky old lady um, <laughs> who had, had her shop for a very long time. Um, the yarn was all kept in plastic bags. She didn't want people to touch the yarn. Um, she, yeah, it was it was very interesting. But over the year or two that I worked with her and with friends and stuff, we ended up helping her uh, rearrange the shop and open it up so that people could see a little bit better. And then eventually, and unfortunately, helped her close her shop because her health was declining. She was an older um, person who's heyday I think was in machine knitting she had she had gone on numerous you know cruises and trips as uh, benefits for being one of the really uh, big sellers of machines, machines uh -huh. for machine knitting yeah Florence Bishop okay yeah. let's see some more knitting or more your knitting. book you could bring your book out oh, sure um, well I'll show you this because it's here since it's already here this is the Morris wrap um, I'm, there we go. Um, the Morris wrap is this. So um, this is a super, super simple pattern. It's just two, like the little gray square and the little black square with the little guys around it. This uh, pattern was inspired by a photo I accidentally took while I was on a, a trip in Peru of a linoleum floor of the place where we stopped to have lunch. So... Um, that's where the pattern is from, and it's also locked floats. So um, this is a really good opportunity for people who want to dive into the process of locked floats or Armenian knitting so that they can work on that, uh, work on their technique because they have a, a decent number of, actually works this way, you know, a decent number of stitches of light, a decent number of stitches of dark so they can repeat that pattern over and over and get used and to it. And you could memorize it. It's easy enough to memorize. Yes. yes. Um, maybe, you know, work on something a little smaller than that to begin with, but that is what that is. Um, yeah, I do have a book. Here's my book. So for those of you who maybe don't know, um, this originally, it has a whole long story. So the first thing that I showed you, that, that little pattern, um, came from Hearst Castle. Now, not everyone knows what Hearst Castle is. It is a property in San Simeon, California, that was owned by William Randolph Hearst, who uh, was a publishing magnet in the U.S. for people who were not here. Um, and he collected uh, suits of armor. He collected Renaissance for fun. Um, there is another museum in Los Angeles with more of his collections. Uh, the man was very, very rich. And the architect on the property was a woman, can you believe it, a woman architect named Julia Morgan. Julia uh, is among one of the, the most, uh, I think, underappreciated architects of our time. 
mostly because her client overshadowed her and also because we do not regard women who are working in predominantly male fields as equal. And it's really unfortunate. Um, she was accommodating to the point, you know, uh, Mr. Hurst, the pool would be completely built and he would say, I don't like it. I want it moved six feet to the left. And Julia would say, okay. And demolish all of the work that had been done, build new plans, come up with a thing and move the thing to the left. Um, so anyway, I was enamored with the, um, the property itself. It's beautiful. And so I negotiated with the, the collection with the people who manage the property and the licensing and all of that to um, create a collection of knitting patterns based on this collection. And that happened. And I spent probably a year and a half developing my proposal. And when it got to Carrie, who was eventually my, uh, my editor, or one of the main people yeah, in my book, we got it developed to get in front of Interweave, then Interweave. And they looked at it, reviewed it, and they said, we love this, but people don't know who Hearst, what Hearst Castle is. And Hearst Castle Knits would be a niche product. They were a little concerned about licensed products as well, I think. I don't think, think they ever had done that. They said, but we like your idea and your concept and all of this. Could you do Art Nouveau knits? So Art Nouveau, for people who may not know, is very, um, it's asymmetrical. And it's all about flowers and nature and lots of movement and intricate patterns. And I said, gosh, that would be awesome. But I'm also trying to picture, are people going to ever make stuff that's like that? You know, you can make really large uh, patterns, but... It would take sm small stitches, or they're like little pixels, and the more little pixels, the better the, the better the picture will be. I said, what about Art Deco knits? Yes, so off we went. So we made Art Deco knits, wrote the entire book, and then the main person at Interweave changed, and they said, Art Deco is too niche of a, of a, <laughs> <laughs> of a market. Um, people don't know what Art Deco is. Pe you know, people don't like Art Deco. People love Art Deco. It's very symmetrical. It's very geometric. It's all of the things that we really like as humans. You know, we like symmetry. It's what makes people beautiful, apparently. So anyway, we changed the name to Urban Knit Collection. So that's a long way to get to this. So the book exists. It is here. Um, Interweave does not exist anymore. So Interweave has gone bankrupt. Interweave, or f and W is now... The book division is owned by um, Penguin, uh, and the and the the books themselves are still distributed and all of that through them. I actually purchased the rights to my book, so I negotiated with them. I have the rights, the digital rights. So many of the patterns are individually available on Ravelry. You can just go buy one of them instead of the entire book. Um, alternatively, the ebook is also there under my name, Kyle William. Uh, and you can buy just the ebook if you're curious or interested or want to. Um, so yeah, that's Urban Knit Collection. And the big, uh, the Demore wrap, let's see, I didn't mark anything in here. Um, do, do, do. Is it fun to watch me do this? Um, <laughs> so the Demore wrap is in there. Um, it's also on the cover, I suppose. They photographed it upside down coincidentally. Um, that also is just what happens when you produce a body of work and it, uh, work in the hands of other creative and the creatives decide what they think is best. And the fountain, <laughs> the fountain, which went this way, became a, um, you know, curtains almost like it looks like curtains and a drape in the middle. So fine. Still looks yeah. cool. Yeah. <laughs> So Kurt has asked a, a question here. I think you may, do you know Kurt Payne? Are you familiar? I do know Kurt. Yeah, Kurt's a lot. He's a good fellow. He says, what is your favorite class to teach? Ah, I really do love teaching locked floats. 
it is a involved class. Um, the my favorite part about it is every person has a uh, the opportunity for a challenge to overcome. The only person who doesn't is a person who both picks and throws. Um, because you're holding yarns in both hands, you're not moving the yarns out of either hand, and you are either throwing or picking, but you're doing both, whether it's the knit side or the purl side. And um, most often people will find frustration in this. Um, continental knitters will say, well, can't I can just do this if I hold both of the yarns in my left hand. Yes, you can on the knit side but when we go to the purl side it becomes a bit of a parlor trick so um, what i like to do in my classes is not necessarily the thing that is easiest for a person at that time but i like to set people up for success and in the case of locked floats um, or armenian knitting handling the yarns separately always means that you never have to worry about the yarns wrapping around each other. It also means that the yarns stay in the same order. It also means that, you know, you know what you're doing, whether you want a light or a dark stitch and whether you're locking which one. So right. um, by the end of that workshop, the majority of people have a really good understanding of what is involved. And then with a little bit of practice, they're able to tackle it. So lock floats, Armenian knitting. That's my favorite. Yeah, so a lot of people have had some experience with locking floats knitting on the right side, but not too many people know about locking floats knitting on the wrong side. Yes. Yeah, it is a, um, it's a bit of a different process, and most of, the, most of the places where locking floats is a popular technique are also the areas in the world where adding the steak, the steak, steaking is not a thing. The steaking is a section. It's like the highway. Right. And cutting your yarn is the, you're cutting, cutting the, the steak. Is, right. is cutting. You're cutting a steak. You're not steaking. Steaking right. is, the, the steak is the thing. The, it's so, a, it's so, not a verb. Yeah. It's a noun. Uh, yeah. So you add those few stitches and then you chop you're knitting and off you go and you were able to create an entire vest or shawl or whatever all by working on the right side or the front side of a project all knit stitches so there was little opportunity to purl and lock floats on a purl side so and and historically historically stranded knitting was one of the earliest types of knitting. If you go back and you look at the 14th century paintings of the Madonna, she's knitting in the round on pins. Mm -hmm. And so um, the stopping that and working it flat is a fairly new thing. You know, yes. not in our lifetimes. It was probably done before our lifetimes. But still, as the history of knitting goes, working yep. stranded work flat is fairly new. Now, there's some more questions here. Good. Susan Day Good. says, I think Suzanne said that Kyle lives in Seattle. What is your favorite local yarn store in the Seattle area? That's a tricky question. <laughs> That's a tricky question. So, yeah, I live just south of Seattle in Auburn. So I'm about 20 minutes or so south of Seattle. Um, I actually work for a yarn shop. I work for Makers Mercantile which is uh, based in Kent, which is just about 15 minutes north of me. That, would, that math doesn't work um, because that sounds like Seattle is five minutes north of <laughs> Kent. That's not true. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, so I work for Makers Mercantile. I love our shop, of course. Uh, many um, different places to come visit in our area as far as shops are concerned. Um, lots of destination shops like Church Mouse, which is on Bainbridge Island. So you get to take a ferry. That's a wonderful experience for people who are not from this part of the country. So you drive onto this big boat and the boat takes you to the island and you drive off and you can stop and, and check out Church Mouse, which has amazing tea and stuff. Um, have ice cream at the place next door and lunch and walk around. Um, there's also uh, Tolt, which is in Carnation, 
um, Carnation, Washington. It's about an hour's drive away. Um, it's out in the country. It's a beautiful little shop with lots of really wonderful yarns. Um, you know, it's just a small town, but the shop itself is gorgeous. Um, it could go on and on. And actually, if you just, you know, spend an afternoon, many of us are in quarantine and locked up, you could pretend that you're going to move to Seattle and just start a list of the different shops that you'd like to visit. And you will find that there are more shops than weeks in the year within driving distance of Seattle. So you could go to a different shop every week and find a new experience. That'd be um, fun. A yeah. shop a week. Somebody should make a calendar. Okay, Absolutely. Here, here's a question from P Patricia. She says, could you do continental and Portuguese for locked floats? Maybe. Maybe. We'd have to play. I don't know for sure. Um, I think the best way to sort things out is, you know, as I... As I learned, you know, at first we learn the basics. So the very first thing in my class is I teach people how to do stranded knitting. Because many of the people, despite what the requirements may lay out in classes, um, students don't always see those or maybe they don't understand them or whatever. But so we first cover the basics of stranded knitting and we make sure that people are not wrapping their yarns around each other as they're doing just basic color work. Then we go into stranded um, and then lock floats on the right side using either the dom the main color or the contrasting color and then so so on. So we'd have to just play, you know, come hang out in Seattle or meet up with me the next time that we're able to do a workshop. And um, I love the opportunity to have people show me different ways that they knit to see how that impacts different techniques. Um, you know, some people say, well, I can't do that because I knit with my left hand. And I say, well, I knit with my left hand, too, but I also use my right hand. It takes two hands for me. Exactly. I tell people when, when I, I've only had a couple people who truly knit left-handed where they move the stitches from the right to the left mm -hmm. who couldn't, yep. weren't willing to change. But most people, and if they're brand new and they're left-handed, I tell them it's like playing the piano or reading a book. You use both sides of your brain equally. It's not right-handed or left-handed. They're really, if someone teaches you, purposely teaches you to knit left-handed, I think that's kind of mean because there are no <laughs> books about left-handed knitting. There's yeah. no patterns yeah. for left-handed knitting. You know, music yeah. is not written in the opposite direction for left-handers. You know, books don't go from right to left for, for right. left-handers. You know, there's just some things where your brain is used equally and knitting is one of those. It's not right-handed or left-handed. It's a two-handed craft. You yes. Know? So there's some more questions here. Duke of Nico says, is it my imagination or did you say you lived in Mississippi at one point? Do you have relatives in the South? I lived for six weeks in Coldwater, Mississippi. So yes, I did. Um, so I was living in Arizona. I moved from there to Mississippi. Um, I was there for about six weeks and moved up from there to just outside of Nashville um, and then on to college and so on. Um, so my dad was in the construction industry. Um, he was a superintendent. So he was the, the fix-it guy, if you will, for all of larger projects. He you know, built bridges and malls and high-rise buildings. And he was the one who managed the subcontractors. Um, and in my book, I actually talk a little bit about um, our relationship and how his taking me to his job sites influenced my um, my eye, he taught me to look at things, to see things that weren't exactly the way necessarily that I had hoped that they would be, and to think about ways to correct those. So as you know, a young, I don't know, five-year-old kid, I would go to these job sites with a piece of chalk and go around to the concrete and mark, you know, where there's potholes in the rough pour of concrete. And the <laughs> if that happened, the, uh, the subcontractors had to fix it. So they would give me quarters to get me to go away. <laughs> um, yeah, so I was sent on my way for pointing out um, challenges. My dad also was a big, um, he believed very much in doing things right the first time um and then my 
good friend John, um, it was, I guess, a little bit of a segue, but he labeled me as impetuous. So I had to look that up. Um, but he reminded me, you know, as a designer, you know, we make a thing, we write a pattern, we knit a sample, and we want to immediately throw it out into the world so that we can get a response. And we love this. We've just, you know, delivered this product. We want everyone else to deliver it. I learned from him, it's okay to wait. Is now the right time to deliver a, you know, color work, you know, super heavy pullover sweater? Probably not in the United States. It's probably not the right time. Maybe you want to hold on to that until it's, you know, earlier, early fall or something. So thinking critically about when you deliver a project for people to see, like a pattern, and thinking um, also anticipating the opportunity for people to make mistakes and figuring out ways to make it easier for them so that that doesn't happen. Those are um, some of the things that I learned from my dad and my friend John. So, Yes, that, and you know, what you said is very true because about wanting to see immediate feedback because it's like giving birth to a baby when yeah. you finish a project. When you're designing it yourself, from from it comes from within you. And when you actually get the thing out in front and complete it, it's, it's your child. And you want mm -hmm. people to go, oh, how beautiful. Right away. Right away. Uh, because that's part of why you do it, too. You know, um, Maybe, like, I consider myself to be a very introverted person, except when it comes to knitting. There I can be extroverted. But the whole rest of my life, like, if you invite me to a party, if it's not about knitting, I'm likely to say, I have other plans. Yeah, yeah. You know, because it just scares me to death to go be in a large group of people, and mm -hmm. it's not going to be about knitting. I don't, I'd rather be at home by myself, right. you know. But when I create something with my knitting, I want it out there right now. It's yeah. really hard to resist this. So do you have some more things to show us there? Yeah, like I wanted to show this little because I thought it was kind of fun. So this was a swatch. So I should go find my cat. Um, this is a little tiny swatch of a shawl because I was trying to sort out the patterning but I didn't want to knit a giant garter stitch shawl <laughs> before figuring out what to do. And I loved what this looked like. And this became my prototype for my proposal for um, when I did this bigger shawl, which, you know, it's hard to see and probably needs to be blocked. But anyway, it, it's a large garter stitch um, triangle, essentially. Mm -hmm. But it has that patterning at the very end. So um, this is another really fun one for people who want to tackle locked floats because you get to do garter stitch for all of your life. And then in your second life, you get to do the color work. So the big finish is at the end. Yes. Um, and that uh, that makes this one a lot of fun because also you've, you've had your sort of social boring knitting and now you get to be excited again because you get to sit alone with your chart and sort out, you know, what is it that I need to do? Oh, okay. You know, and the lock floats again on the back. So very pretty. I love the colors in that too. Yeah. This is Quince and company, the yarn. Um, yeah. So, so Kyle fun. asked another question. He said, what's your favorite new yarn? Ah, there's a new yarn that's coming out. I don't have it. Well, I do have it actually in the other room that is called Pop Cycle. It's out already. Um, and of course, like I said, which is owned by Scassell. And Scassell is distributed, distributes lots of yarns. And they also manufacture um, or have manufactured all of the haiku yarns. And Pop Cycle is a recycled yarn that um, each uh, gain, each hank is two bottles, two recycled like soda bottles worth of material in them. So that's pretty cool. And the, the material that is produced when you work with it is awesome. So yeah, pop cycle is really cool. Um, 
So there's another question here. This is from Hayes Russick, and they, how is Lily feeling? <laughs> Lily is fine. Um, she is, I lit the last fire log, so she's in front of the fireplace. So yeah. Is she the new one? Uh, I rescued Lily here um, a year ago, August. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So um, we did a this team building exercise thing through work. And one of the things that there was a whole series of challenges and each thing that you did, they were all, most of them were ridiculous. Um, and each one that you did, you earned points. And then the team with the most points was able to enter this thing. And it was, it's a national, I think, or maybe even international um, program. And the winning team got an all expense paid trip to Hawaii and all of this stuff. So one of the things that we did was went to a local rescue and did selfies with animals and posted them on social media to encourage people to consider right. adopting rescue animals. And I ended up taking Lily home. <laughs> so yeah, she's fine. Good. Um, so now what yeah. about this vest that's on the mannequin? Oh, that, that old thing? Um, <laughs> does it look familiar? So that is from Cast On from a number of years ago. Um, and it is, uh, it's probably one of my favorite things I did. Um, the thing that I like the best about it is um, the back, which is, oh, I can spin it around. Um Oh, yes, I remember that. That's gorgeous. Yeah. So I didn't know what to do for the back. So I knitted the entire front very quickly. It's locked floats and all of that. It was in Cast On magazine, and now it's a, a individual pattern that I am I have on uh, Ravelry. And I wasn't sure what to do for the back. So I said, all right, I'm just going to knit a solid back because most guys don't like a lot of pattern in, in their projects. Uh, or the things that they wear. Most guys are boring. Uh, it's a fact. It's um, it is the way it is. There are some people who are very fashionable and some that are not. And I thought that coupled with the challenge of working that pattern in the front, if only half of it has to be that, then the back could be really simple. We also call a sweater that only has pattern on the front a um, a coffin sweater or funeral sweater because oh you, know, you lay in a coffin like oh. this. We see the front. Right. So it's a perfect coffin sweater. You know, you oh only worry my. about what's on the front. Um, so I worked on it and I was talking with my knitting group. I was in San Francisco at the time and I asked them and Kevin, one, I believe, no, was it Kevin? Well, it was one of them, one of the amazing guys there. He said, why don't you just take one of the, sorry, going to make everyone dizzy. Um, just take one of the rows out of this pattern and just repeat it. So that's what I did. I chose a row out of here and just kept doing it over and over and over. And of course it makes vertical stripes because you're doing the same thing over and over, but then both of the yarns also happen to change color at the same time and so on and so forth. And that's where that, uh, it's really pretty, very effective, very effective. So yeah, now you have your patterns on Ravelry, right? I do have my patterns on Ravelry. Uh, many of them are. Um, not everything that I produce is um, is something that I own. I often design for other companies and magazines and books and stuff. But the ones that I have rights to are under my label, which is Kyle William. Um, and for the people who are watching this uh, episode now through um, the end of the month, if they use the code Suzanne, um, they are able to take 25% off of any of those patterns. And I included the ebook as well. So I really am delighted for people to purchase patterns and take them. Uh, and use them. Yes, they're beautiful. Something, something. I Make might, I might, uh, I might grab a few myself. Products. Yes, they're gorgeous. So um, now, when when we don't have a coronavirus happening, well, let me see. They're one of the very first questions that somebody asked, but it wasn't really a good time to uh, ask that. Is um, let's let me find it. I'm sorry. 
That's right okay. back here. Um, it's from MK. What impact will COVID-19 lockdowns have on the business of knitting? Oh, that's a very big question. Um, I believe, I'll answer the question in a different way, which is um, in the United States, 9-11 was, a, um, was uh, something that impacted everyone across the nation. It was a tragedy and it affected all of many of the same kinds of uh, areas of life that COVID-19 is affecting now. Um, it also, for different reasons, people isolated. Um, it was a little perhaps more emotional isolation. But I think that in times when um, things get hard, we go back to the basics, to, this, to things that help us find be comfortable, find comfort in, you know, the things that we're doing. We like to, um, one of the things that knitting does for me and crochet, absolutely, is uh, it records time. And in lockdown, as many of us are locked down, um, time is difficult. We keep asking our, you know, looking on, <laughs> on devices or our you know, phones or whatever, what day is it? What day, wait, again, what day is it? And suddenly I, I'm beginning to realize what it might be like to be in a, you know, a, a, a senior citizen home, like a, you know, older person home, isolated from, not necessarily from the world because everything is happening around us, but in our own little cocoon, we're stuck. And so being able to produce something helps us re remember that we are, alive and we are um, human and able to make some kind of contribution. Um, I believe that for those people who are being drawn to learn or improve skills, it's a good opportunity to do that. I also think that if someone doesn't want to do anything at all, if you don't find yourself inspired, you don't find yourself creative, you know, wanting to tackle a thing, you don't want to, you know, bust through level two of that master hand knitting program, totally okay. It is okay to feel however you feel. Um, and things will eventually change. They will, um, we will learn more about this virus, of course. Um, we don't know everything, I, I think. Um, and I think it's really good for us to remember that we don't know everything. Um, that uh, we are all doing the best we can. As far as small businesses, it's hard to say. It depends on uh, the businesses themselves, I guess. Um, our shop is all right right now. Um, there, we're doing orders and stuff online, um, shipping if it's possible. Our state's on lockdown, so it's very... Um, important that everyone stays very far away from each other and we don't um, actually most of the staff isn't even there so on a day that's shipping I will go in pull orders and ship them it's not a full staff of people so things are pulled way 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 back to make it safe for everyone but trying to eke along the economy until um, things get better so I don't know if that even answered it. But, I thought that was a fantastic um, answer. That was a really, really good answer. And I, I would like to add a little bit to it is that if you look historically back past 9-11 to the wars, the great wars, uh, that's when knitting picked up. Each one of those times was when knitting picked up. Now, right now, a lot of people who don't knit and people who do knit are making masks. You know, it's the same sort of thing as you feel like you want to be yes. needed and that you want to do something that will help, help someone else. And for a lot of people, uh, also knitting brings them solace, you know, calms and, and helps peaceful on the inside. The problem is not having access to so much yarn. But thankfully, many of us have large stashes. And this yes. is when your stash comes in handy. But... 
the yarn stores will benefit because if we use up our stash, guess what? We're going to be buying more yarn as soon as we can. And same thing with fabric for uh, sewing the mass. If you've gone online to look for fabric, it's even hard to find fabric because so many people have purchased the online fabric that it's literally out of stock. So you know that those companies are doing okay. And Procter & Gamble came out, and that doesn't have anything to do with knitting or, or sewing, but they have to do with hand washing things. You know, Procter & Gamble had the best quarter they've ever had in their company's history, in the yeah. history of the company. Uh, so I'll add, let me add one little thing while you, before you finish your thought, or maybe I should let you finish. No, you go uh, fine. <laughs> sorry. Um, <clears throat> I would also say, um, <clears throat> maybe you should finish because now I'm going to choke. <laughs> <laughs> Where's um, water? <laughs> I, yeah, I, um, I've been making masks. I don't, I'm not a sewer. I, you know, like I have a sewing machine and I like the idea of sewing. Um, I'm pulled out my machine and I'm making masks and sending them out to people who need them. Um, and I'm not doing it because I want to make money. I do it because I want to use the tools and what abilities I have to help other people. And so I encourage you, you know, if someone does, if you have a sewing machine, there are a lot of really helpful um, tutorials on YouTube that show you the basics of how to thread your machine. They, there are tutorials on how to make very simple masks. So if you have, you know, even just cotton bed sheet, you can cut that apart and uh, make a really simple mask that could potentially save lives and help other people. So um, we think that it's something that other people need to do this, like changing the world. And really it's having an impact, helping one person at a time. One at a time. Being better, checking in on your friends, um, you know, checking in even on your... Even doing this, uh, even doing this so we can this, still communicate, yeah. you know? Yeah, absolutely. So, well, I'm going to start wrapping this up. I want to thank you so much for being my guest this week. It's been really cool. And I look forward to seeing you the next time we get together face to face. Yes, me too. It'll be very fun. So um, we're going to say goodbye and thank you, Kyle. And thank you for everybody for participating and your questions. And we'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.